So this one is called Taking on the Tough Vertical Challenges. We learned a little stuff about ticketing. Um, I'm going to let our panelists introduce themselves and explain their particular relationships to vertical markets. And then I have a set of questions and encourage everybody to have their questions in mind as well. So we'll start with Valer and work our way, our left to right, your right to left. Sure. Can you hear me okay, Dar? Right. So my name is Valer Marini. I come from the Netherlands. I work for uh, ING. I've been in banking for 20 plus years, um, in corporate banking, corporate finance, retail banking, e-business, IT, uh, insurance. Um, I'm currently uh, running a, uh, an intelligent assistance project, uh, an R&D project for ING. I'm Wayne Scholar. I'm uh, the co-founder and chief technology officer with GitAbby. Uh, GitAbby is an intelligent virtual assistant platform that allows anyone to be able to build their own intelligent virtual assistants. Uh, sort of our unique position is a, a, a human avatar, um, and well, I can talk about that later. Uh, we're primarily in healthcare, uh, insurance, and retail. Hi, my name is Hara. I'm associated with Finn, you know, and we've just launched our world's first intelligent financial assistant yesterday on this uh, very podium. Uh, I would have more details, but this is a vertical specialized uh, entity focusing on servicing the investment and financial needs of the consumers. Very good, and thanks for introducing it here, and we're very excited for you. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna start with Wayne, though. <laughs> Um, so you remember in our uh, level setting slide, we, we had sort of a continuum from assistance that um, are uh, basically going against a static set of information and offers some limited capabilities. <clears throat> and our, our premise is that we're moving along a continuum towards more transactional, more dynamic information, more personalized. And that part of that, I think, means that it gets vertical, it's answering some of the specifics of a vertical company or market and that sort of thing. So I, I know that, that um, GetAbby has a number of verticals that it serves. I'm wondering if there's some comments you'd like to make about where we're at along the continuum and whether some are more ripe than others. Sure, and I, I think there's uh, three aspects to look at. You have the end consumer, right, and where they are in the uh, continuum. We have uh, us as, as providers and intelligent virtual agents. And, and then you have the, the, the organizations that are leveraging them for their brands. Hmm. Um, I, I think that all of us are sort of learning how to walk at this stage. Um, we're starting to do some, some really interesting things, changing mindsets and, and beginning to cause people to think differently. And I'll, and I'll highlight that, and, and, and it's really the conversations that we, we start to have is, is really shifted from what's an avatar, what's an intelligent agent, uh, to can it do X, can it do Y, and, and those sorts of conversations. And then when you look at the implementation life cycle, um, it, it, it becomes one where we, we've seen it come full cycle. You, you, it, our clients will typically say, we understand our customers, we know what our, the agents are gonna be asked, and, and we tell them, yep, sure, I understand that, but you, you gotta be prepared for learning. Um, and, and, and then inevitably when, when the avatar gets into production, uh, you end up with them saying, wow, we didn't expect that. And what we're seeing in the life cycle is now that they're open to allowing the actual consumer's voice to drive the direction of what the agent's capabilities are. Interesting. Comments from? Well, um, it's an interesting point uh, Wayne made. Uh, the, the conversations have shifted from what it is to how it can help. Uh, so when we conceived about the idea of the FIN1 as an intelligent assistant focused at uh, financial services, uh, you need to address the ROI at all levels, right? From what it can do for the consumer and what it could do for the financial services providers who are providing these uh, services as well as the larger ecosystem. It's not so much about what's under the hood but essentially what it could do. Uh, that's where, in fact, uh, we see the maturity curve uh, arriving at in, in such a short span, going back to your point, Dan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is happening fast. <laughs> and go ahead, Blair. I just um, um, 
chime in there. Um, um, we, um, when you look at um, the um, um, industry, and, and, and another industry, for instance, the car industry, um, we, uh, we compare ourselves sometimes to, um, it took them probably 50, 60, 70 years to uh, get to the self-driving car, um, starting with uh, not so intelligent assistance such as the automatic gearbox and uh, going through cruise control, adaptive cruise control, lane departure, warning systems, navigation, voice command, and what have you. Um, they actually uh, are very close technologically to cracking it. There are some regulatory and, and, and liability and compliance issues, of course, still out there. Um, the challenge for the industry, the banking industry, is if you compare it with that analog and physical mm -hmm. uh, um, example of the car, is that we've been digitized or digitalized <laughs> already for, for quite some time. Um, and we are nowhere close to uh, the equivalent of a self-driving car uh, currently. I think we have some robo-advisors in the making, we have some PFM tools, um, but actually technologically, uh, and I'm not talking about the channel and, and, and the UX side of the things, but the, the engine of it, which is under the bonnet, uh, we still have a long way to go. The challenge is we don't have 70 years, we have at most five probably. Wow. <laughs> it's our first mention of years, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Okay, why not three? But um, are, there, most. <laughs> are there specific gaps that you would percolate up to the top? I know, and first of all, I, I'm really glad you held that standards discussion. But, but um, uh, does that, w will those standards be across vertical or, or there's some commonalities? Or like banking's got to be very different from, say, um, healthcare. So, and, right, so the, 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 the general conversation starts around, is there going to be a master algorithm that you know, solves world, all the world's problems, right? And, and I'm more in the camp of, at least now, where if your intelligent agent can answer 250 questions or provide this specific pieces of functionality, uh, that's a solid agent, and that agent should be able to speak to other agents to be able to expand its capabilities. Um, so that, that's, that's sort of the, the intent behind the standard or sort of the consortium is figuring out how all of us could be able to leverage each other's expertise. It, it eventually gets so far as if you, you know, take it back to looking at the web and how that evolved, you had, you know, ICANN and registers of right. domain names, we'd have registers of avatars, uh, you get into, you know, security and SSL, we'd have the same source of concepts for agents. Um, but then, you know, as tools evolve, which a lot of us in the industry are building as platforms to allow others to be able to build agents, as it evolves, developers then could start to be able to put their own agents into the network, and, and it, it becomes the, the network effect then, uh, and agents leveraging other agents' knowledge. Interesting. I, I just had a flash on, on electronic document interchange, which is sort of the closest thing. Um, you know, there were, there, it sort of started in healthcare so that hospitals could order supplies in, in some way, so there was a flavor of EDI for healthcare, and then it, it like fanned out into, into other verticals, but oh, have to. I, I think that there'll be, you know, each agent will advertise the attributes that they, they, they would need or have to be able to engage with, mm -hmm. and that's where we could keep it within one standard, if you will, um, but they would have specifics from an industry uh, spot. Mm -hmm. We'll watch for that. So Dan, uh, to add to what Vayan said, I think the standards have um, two dimensions here. What's within this ecosystem of uh, intelligent assistance, what we do, versus what you do with the external world to this, which is what is the vertical world. You know, when you talk about uh, the financial services, you know, your standard messaging formats, you know, in fact, how you do the handshake with your backend systems is very important uh, from compliance point of view, from bringing in the predictability, as well as even the deployment comfort and the timelines. So I think, you know, whenever you're talking about the standards, you need to address both, uh, both the industry-specific as well as what it is to our ecosystem. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Yeah. And, and Valera's framing was around sort of cars going from uh, autom automatizing some things <laughs> to, to then um, becoming sort of, uh, it's sort of the difference between automating and assisting. Um, if we zoom out, we had a little discussion a little earlier, Hara, about um, one of the gating items right now is, is getting user trust. And, yes. and so 
it, this gets to the story of, of in, in, whether it's healthcare or um, financial services, we're getting into some very personal information and, and um, uh, absolutely. I think um, if, if we look at the traditional proposition of a bank, it basically comes down to trust and money, right? right. You, you basically tell the customer, trust us with your money and we'll keep it safe for you. Uh, trust us with your money and uh, we'll make it work harder for you. Trust us with your money and we'll create the applications and the infrastructure for you to easily access and manage it. Now, when money becomes data, uh, the step to the proposition of the 21st century for a bank um, is, uh, is relatively small because it's basically trust us with your data and we'll keep it safe for you, trust us with your data and we'll make it work harder for you and trust us with your data and we'll create the applications and infrastructure for you to easily access and manage it. It's easier said than done, of course, um, but that trust has to be earned. Um, um, and whereas the trust, even as a traditional financial institution, has been tarnished in the past uh, couple of years, uh, banks have a again a, quite a quite an uh, quite a task to do here. Um, a trust again coming back to my favorite example of the of the self-driving car, as if you had put someone in a car uh, 20 years ago and you told them you don't have to touch the steering wheel or the pedals, all you have to say is where you want to go, they would freak out, right? Um, and, and similarly, we can't just um, even if technology allowed us to do uh, the virtual private banker uh, tomorrow. Uh, it would probably be a flop on the market because the, the customer is not ready yet. So that trust has to be earned, and customers will first take um, uh, alerts, uh, then insights, then they will take advice, still making their own decision and execution. And, and when they feel totally 100% comfortable with actually the, the right uh, actions being promoted and suggested by the engine or by the uh, assistant, they will say, okay, and now I'm happy for you to just do it for me. So I think, um, just to add to uh, the points Valor made, um, in a financial institution's context, the trust has three components. One is the capability of the person I'm dealing with. Second, the motivation of the person I'm dealing with. And the third is the, the whatever we talk about, the security aspects. Right? Uh, in fact, when, you know, even today, this afternoon, I was talking to some of our participants, you know, if I were to give you a virtual financial assistant, you know, who is going to be your full time, all the time with you in giving you advice, close your eyes and see what would you want and what would be your concerns be? And one of the points, you know, Pawan was mentioning is that, hey, you know what? I don't want my intelligent assistant to quote me out of context. Yes, context is very important, but sometimes I put some trivia, you know, I don't want to be quoted or taken into the intelligence of the consumption out of context. But coming back to the trust part of it, uh, the capability part, um, you know, in fact, lots of consumers as well as the bankers alike, they say the ability to glean the information and uh, bring in an intelligence, that's where your virtual assistants or intelligent financial assistants can score over your regular uh, wealth advisors, uh, not that they are going to replace, but as an extension to them. Uh, but the motivation is a very important aspect, you know. So uh, whenever I talk to my rep, my immediate predominant thought, when is she selling it to me? What is her motivation in mm. giving this recommendation? So versus being advised in my context based on the opportunities available. And of course, these are very important as we establish the trust. You do not have the, the context like what we were seeing in an investment context, uh, the vintage of an advisor, whether she's been practicing for five years or 10 years, has she gone through the upturn, downturn of the market, but here bringing in all that intelligence uh, is an important element to bring the trust. Uh, yeah, I'd agree. It's availability and experience over time that, that builds the trust, and you know, we focus on also adding in the human uh, aspect to it because people want to relate to people. Uh, in, in healthcare, you know, and I've written a paper on this about um, using avatars to help uh, bring uh, personal responsibility to healthcare. And uh, a number of large players in the markets are asking us to uh, develop personal health coaches uh, mm -hmm. to solve things like uh, chronic disease state management uh, and then overall uh, general wellness uh, to prevent uh, events from occurring uh, ahead of time. And uh, with that comes sort of the patient profile uh, that you build, and, and, and there's a lot of trust in, in having that data. But uh, what's interesting is 
in, in healthcare, and, and I think it, it, it crosses some other industries. Um, we don't own our data now. I mean, the, especially in healthcare, it's in uh, the medical record systems, and we only have access to it when our doctors or, or care providers may give it to us. So, um, you know, creating a coach that can show you and, and tell you and explain to you what these numbers mean, you know, it's great I slept X number of hours long term, what's that mean, what's that mean to people like me, and those sorts of things come up. Interesting. Because <clears throat> part of that continuum from an assistant to something, and, and one of the words I really liked, I think, in, in our, we used in one of our conversations was um, they're really becoming a companion now. Yes. And, and somebody else was showing us um, a, a way to think of these avatars. Um, what if the avatar is you? I mean, we're, we're, we keep thinking that we're going to invoke this human-like thing, but, but what if the human is me, and as I think about using my virtual companion, or me, um, to carry out these tasks. It's very different in healthcare, where it's a coach, it's a voice speaking in your right ear to you know, go exercise, or don't, <laughs> um, as in finance, where you're saying, well, you know, can, can I watch my nest egg grow or shrink or, or whatever? And, and um, uh, well, We were even at dinner last night, I think, speaking about knowing um, you know, whether you're at that art, art gallery going to buy that painting and the advisor would chime in and say, well, that adds two more years to your right. college fund. Right. It's like, do we need an intervention? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Well, how close are we to that? And, and where do you, how do, you know, <clears throat> there's, there's a human side to that which says, I, would, you, would a person want that uh, form of alert <laughs> happening? I, 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 I'm sorry, it's, I know it's about finance and health, but I yeah. come back to my car analogy again. <laughs> um, you know, there are, there are folks out there who don't like all these systems in the car, and, right. and there are, the, the better cars, the better manufacturers will just allow you to switch them off, right? And uh -huh. you, you, can, um, you can basically <coughs> decide how you're going to use your assistance um, um, and uh, set down basically the, the rules, right? Yeah. Well, there's a flip side to that, too. I, I had friends who were working on the Google self-driving car. And like three years ago, I caught wind, and I said, oh, I hear you're working on the autonomous car. And they said, well, it's not autonomous. I mean, autonomous means you get in and say, I want to go across town and say, I don't feel like that right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, in, in, in my, I agree. In, in, in my view, I think uh, these two are uh, interchangeable. And, uh, which, neither, which two? In, in terms of the self-driven self-servers, autonomous versus assisted and coached oh. and advised. And um, it, you, you can't really juxtapose one against the other. It, you need both. You, know, you need to really see the, the self-directed one as an extinction to your advised ones. And advised ones are more pricier, more specialized conversations. And most important thing is between these two, you should be able to extend the context. You know, that's when you're able to really deliver personalized service. Because at the end of the day, what are we trying to solve? You know, in an in a, a intelligent assistant, you are bringing in the highest degree of personalization, whether it's healthcare, automobile, or in finance. And that degree of personalization is possible when you are able to extend the context between these two. And, and I think one other dimension, I liked your comments on this as well, is <clears throat> as, as we look at a, what, what they call, used to call, well, in CRM, they call the customer lifecycle management. There's a point when you're the shopper and non-decision maker, as opposed to after you have declared your loyalty, you are a customer, and there's a different set of services there. Uh, I'm thinking in healthcare, there, you know, the gift that keeps on giving is, you know, the, the annual uh, enrollment period when you have to march through um, what amounts to form filling to pick a plan and when the assistant is an advisor at that point versus when you already have settled in and that advisor might be your coach and, and yeah and, and we've actually seen in implementations where um, the trust factor getting back to the trust factor um, because they're not concerned about the judgment <laughs> from an individual I mean the human judgment it, it's it's reality right uh, being judged by making the decision to not purchase or to purchase certain things or to disclose that I don't have the budget for X, Y, and Z. Um, but continuously across all of our implementations, we see uh, that individuals uh, end up telling Abby the, the, the things that they wouldn't tell a human. 
And it's with full knowledge that Abby is correct. human like, but, but not. Correct. No, I think uh, that goes back to the trust. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. you, you, you do not want to be judged, and you enhance the trust by keeping the privacy. Mm -hmm. no, it, it has to be really um, easy. I'm coming back to that point of um, trust us with your data, and we'll create the applications and infrastructure for you to easily access and manage it. Really has to be easy for the user to be able to say, I want to share this data with my primary bank uh, and this data with my secondary banks or with my accountant or with my tax advisor. So these, these compartments of data, right. um, it should be really easy for the, for the user to manage. And, and I think to that point, I mean, those are some of the, the legwork that we need to do as an industry to, to create the format because if we're going to have our own personal agents uh, whether that be Siri or, you know, three others that, that don't exist yet today, um, that data needs to be in a central place so that you can, you own it, right, and, and you feel comfortable with that, um, but then you can leverage the network of agents uh, and, and, and be able to do the things you want to do. At the end of the day, I think trust uh, from a banking perspective or from a financial services perspective uh, is probably, um, it can be won only if the advisor, the assistant, really represents your interests. If there are no kickbacks on the back, if there are no commissions on the back, yeah. if, um, if there's a very transparent revenue model whereas where, you, where you pay for your digital assistant, for your intelligent assistant, to give the best possible advice, uh, which is best possible from your perspective. Um, no, no and I, I completely agree. You know, in fact, that's what I was talking about, the motivation part of it or lack of it. You know? So another dimension to building more trust is the proactiveness uh, which your intelligent assistant can provide, which in some cases may lack uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a financial, large financial institution, could be even for small ticket conversations. So how do you really take, you know, amongst the channels of, like for example, you have mobile trading, mobile banking, to an intelligent assistant, which is, you know, if that's able to give me a proactive intervention required, hey Hara, you need to do this, uh, my trust would be further enhanced. Those proactive <laughs> assistant. Well, and that becomes interesting, I mean, you know, and, and this is another piece that'll, that'll come along to the market, I think, for us. Uh, to be able to leverage is sort of those models as a service. Um, there, there's a sort of a growing movement of machine learning models as a service. So and everyone talks about the deep learning that we need to do and you know certain uh, a agent companies have expertise in those areas, others don't, but it, you, with models as a service, you can just leverage those models in, that are out in the network and be able to provide those proactive uh, services and, and really begin to see the consumer intent. Wow. Hmm. Reminds me of a phone call I had with my mom two weeks ago, and she interrupted me in the middle and said, just what is an algorithm? And, <laughs> and I said, well, okay, it's a formula, it's a model, it, it's kind of like God. <laughs> um, questions? Over here. So we've heard a lot about um, virtual agents learning from previous interactions and the machine learning elements and algorithms and so on. It strikes me a lot of the data in healthcare is, is under HIPAA. In finance, you've got PCI compliance, those kind of things. Have we seen scenarios where you know, that data comes un under PCI zones where we just can't use it for training? Is, is it going to be a problem? Can we actually learn from that data, I guess is the question. Great question. Yeah, I, I think, you know, um, when, when you talk about compliance, there's lot, lots of fuzziness around that. You know, I think we need to uh, extend this as any other channel. I'm talking about the financial services. Whatever applies to your good old passive mobile channel would definitely apply. And having said that, here we're talking about uh, capturing the consumption intelligence. Uh, what it means is that it's not about what you're buying, you know, where you're buying it, what time are you buying and how you're buying, etc. So as long as the financial institution is able to anonymize that, and as long as they're able to watch for that, that, you know, uh, they're not going to use it for um, any other specific uh, uh, conversations beyond the financial institution to the consumer agreement, it should be fine. So you are well within the cover. That's where, in fact, I would rather um, advocate a verticalized assistant as against a, a horizontal, 
all-purpose intelligent assistant which could make you coffee to serve <laughs> you an investment advice. Um, I, I, I've been trying to follow some of the conversations around actually having that uh, an agent extended to for consent, right? So we all fill out those HIPAA forms and, and, and those sorts of things. But um, I, I think that may be where, where it goes to is, I don't want to say an opt-in, but that sort of uh, consent. Um, I don't know whether this uh, adds, I, I agree with what the gentleman here said, but in, in Europe there is a piece of legislation on the table currently called PSD2, Payment Services Directive 2, which will open the gates uh, wide uh, for, um, for new entrants to the industry, whereby banks may be uh, obliged by their customers to open up their transaction data for third-party service providers. Um, so that's, that's going to be, uh, and at that point in time, the discussion is not going to be even taking place anymore. It's going to be a fact. But that, that flies in the face of a lot of other privacy and personal data protection. That it's it's at the initiative of the customer. Customer owns the data. Customer owns the data. If the customer says, I want you to share, share my transaction third with third parties, they have to do that. Banks will have okay. to do that. That sounds like something we have to pay close attention to because yeah, customer sure. control of disclosure and release of personal information is just vital to this. And, and um, we'll begin with hope to look more like Europe than we look like our historic um, giving away our rights. But that'll come up in the last session today. <laughs> yeah, question here. You guys mentioned uh, proactivity and reaching out to the customers. What are your thoughts on the balance of that getting annoying? For example, when the bank blocks my card because of they think it's fraud and it's actually I'm in Vegas and losing all my money, um, <laughs> you know, I get really angry. I'm glad they're watching my back, but at the same time, it's a little bit too much sometimes. So if I have an agent in health and finance and insurance all proactively pinging me, I'm just going to be overwhelmed. So I know there's a balance. What are your thoughts on where it's helpful and where it's, you know, invasive? Absolutely, and, and you, you could take it to any kind of advertising that goes on now and, and the like. I think that um, your virtual agents should learn you, right, and, and know your preferences and, hey, do I, am I very detailed and I want to be in the weeds and know every sort of alert that should be out there, or just give me the medium level ones or the high level ones. Um, I, I think it's, you know, when, when you create um, you know, sort of a standard that can be helped controlled so that other agents know what sort of level uh, your preferences are so you can say you don't have to set those every time, right? It just knows, hey, I, I just want the, the real important alerts. Let's not get into the details. But it, but it has to be conversational, I think, is, is really the end answer, and, and, and your avatar should know you. In my view, I think, you know, invasiveness has two components. One is that access to your information and uh, processing that information to give you call to action. And, um, I mean, I like Wayne said, you know, you need to be able to confirm as a consumer what you want your assistant to do. You know, you could choose to uh, not to be reminded at odd hours, you know, a call to action, but you could definitely choose to record that information for your further usage. Yeah, but so so here's a here's something I'd like to hear us talk about is is um, there, there we have multiple personalities when we're <laughs> out there. So there may be you know um, shopping me, gambling me, um, <laughs> uh, and 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 so there's a way to disclose, or there, there's <clears throat> maybe even not the personal recognition of what I am at that point in time, and and um, but there may be a way for me to disclose my preferences. Which, which could be umbrella, but um, what we heard in the Ticketmaster example is that we're gonna measure success by lack of consumer effort. You, you just don't, I don't wanna make the effort. And I guess to your question, I mean, what, what if it knew, whoops, knew that you were in Vegas <laughs> and said, okay, what goes on in Vegas stays in <laughs> Vegas, we're not gonna intrude there. And, and just based on knowing your location said, you know, you're, but anyway, is that even something that could happen? I mean, how do we handle the multi-personality? Uh, yeah. Who, who, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, who says you can't have more mm -hmm. digital identities? I mean, um, that's, that's, that I think should be quite possible. Uh, I'm not saying it's easy to manage, but um, um, I think one important uh, feature or function for a really, a really intelligent assistant should be 
uh, not just learning but memory as well um, and not just learning from you but from users like you on an anonymous <laughs> basis and coming back a little bit to the her mm -hmm. yeah. uh, um, uh, scenario <coughs> here um, so um, I think uh, it's, it's an evolution uh, of as if you had a human assistant uh, whom you meet Correct. for the first time and uh, whom you will have to probably brief in an hour, hour and a half about your ways of doing business, your ways of making appointments, your ways of doing business in Vegas, um, and, um, and, and, and the assistant will have to learn. Yeah. I, I just had this flashback to that conversation I had with Adam Chire from Siri. Um, the conversation started out with, how did you like the movie Her? And I said, you know, I liked it fine. He said, well, um, for the first, like, third of the movie, I was trying to figure out how I would program that. <laughs> and then he said, then a, an unexpected event happened. She asked, can I watch you sleep? And then he said, aha, that is the different here. You know, this is when your operating system with, is, is going to learn about you. And, and he said, that's interesting. But anyway, Amy. So uh, one of the previous speakers talked about how innovation often meets against resistance at the beginning. And I'm just curious, um, what are you seeing? Like, I know that, you know, we tested out the, the Inga assistant, or we saw that. That was one of the entrants. What, are, are you seeing, you know, resistance or a lot of interest in adopting that kind of thing? And then also in healthcare, are you, what, you know, there's kind of a tension between people want new things, but there's also resistance against the, the innovation. So I'm curious how that works in your verticals. Um, I, if I speak for ING, ING's purpose um, uh, is to empower people to stay a step ahead in life and business. Um, and it's really translating into all the languages where ING operates, and ING operates still across a lot of countries. Um, and innovation is, uh, is really built into the DNA of the company. Um, we've had a couple of rough years. Um, but this is the company that came up with ING Direct uh, and has really um, uh, uh, invented the direct banking model um, and made it big. Um, so that DNA is really helping us through uh, in, in, uh, in these times where I think the, the, the really important thing for ING is that we have a, uh, a board that recognizes and realizes the magnitude of the disruption coming at us. Mm -hmm. They're not paying lip service to that. So it's really going through down uh, at all levels of the organization. Is there, is there resistance? Of course, hmm. there is resistance. Of course, there are short-term P&L pressures and sales targets. Um, so it, 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 it's always a game of, of give or take, balancing um, compromises. Um, but I think that the company is really gearing up to the challenge. I, I think it's uh, sort of twofold, and, and one is, um, if I look at my, my customers or our customers in the industry, uh, you're, you're starting to see that cross the chasm aspect happening mm -hmm. where um, the, they're looking at what are the best practices, what's the life cycle, what's the development life cycle, what's the implementation life cycle, what's the support life cycle, and moving the, the, the budgets from sort of that innovation budget to sort of planned budgeting for areas. Um, from a consumer standpoint, uh, I think they're really the ones driving this, uh, driving the demand because of the need for 24-7, 365. So right now, they're left with a, a shut door, if you will, at times. So um, I think they're, they're consuming, and, and we have things like Siri and, and Google also assisting in, hey, I understand generally what this technology is, and I understand it, it may not be to the level of my expectations just yet, but it is, it is a step in the right direction, and it allows me to begin the conversation and then, you know, if, if an agent's done well, I can complete certain transactions and, and be self-served. We discussed last night, you know, in fact, um, you know, we are seeing uh, tremendous excitement uh, both at enterprise level as well as the consumer level. Essentially, the resistance uh, to change comes because uh, lack of clarity on the two dimensions. One, what's in it for me and what does it take to make it to happen or what does it take away from me? So. At the financial institution level, when you're saying that, look, it doesn't cost a bomb, you know, you could do it in a 
uh, focused areas as a keyhole surgery. It takes few few weeks, you know, about eight to ten weeks, and you are there to deploy this. Uh, that brings a lot of comfort. You know, you don't have to, you know, shake the whole organization. That's very comfortable for them. You know, juxtaposed to that, you know, the amount of efficiency that they could um, bring into their advisors, uh, you know, our reps. That's, that's an excitement for a financial institution. As far as the consumer is concerned, the fact that, you know, my advisor is going to be a lot more proactive, you know, my advisor is going to help me, and without the bias just, you know, you know, judgment or motive, uh, that is an excitement from the consumer. So I think, you know, uh, there is a reasonable amount of excitement. But having said that, we need to define uh, a, a deployment conversation, you know, because uh, uh, when it is very fuzzy, it's very easy to get lost in all that what so far has not been happening. This one little thing is going to address for me. So we need to be able to say that, look, these are the potential benefits which you're going to get and that if you're able to articulate on a, over a period of time it would be like any other technology deployment to my mind. But how about any sort of product marketing challenge? I, I mean, I, what, what we haven't really talked about is, is segmentation that inevitably happens in a vertical and you're going to do stuff for your high net worth investor Precisely. that you aren't doing for the college kid that is opening a checking account because they're out of town for the first time. <laughs> so it, it gets pretty interesting. Yes, I, I just have a question. I actually follow up on that, what you're talking about, Hara. I, I found it very interesting, the idea of motivation from an intelligent assistant perspective. What, what's their incentive? What's, what's in it for them, right? And especially when it comes to financial advisor, we, we hear about robo-advisors, the, you know, the ability to kind of create this you know, wealth for, for high net wealth individuals. And we talk about the metrics of call deflection and taking away jobs and contact center agents. Is the idea of robo-advisors taking jobs away from actual human Financial advisors is that, is that you know is that a threat to them? No, so uh, I've I've spoken to dozens of uh, financial advisors in different geographies, you know, right in UK, in in Asia as well as in the United States here. Um, here again, the articulation, you know, what's in it for me and what does it take away from me? You know, uh, they are quite excited uh, from the fact that within their window of opportunity of time, uh, they are able to do a lot more. Um, you know, conversations and a lot more conversions with their consumers. Uh, here is a context, you know, if I were to be your wealth advisor and if I need to wait for a, a conversation face-to-face -face with you versus asynchronously I'm able to collaborate with you, you know, digitally annotating my messages and uh, giving a voice over through your advisor and the virtual assistant, uh, our intelligent financial assistant, you mean, and also collect the data points in terms of your consumption and able to watch over if you actually are sidestepping your asset distribution, I'm able to intervene. Uh, in fact, you would find me a lot more connected with you. Hmm. You know, in fact, this can enhance the effectiveness of an advisor, and they are welcoming it from that point of view. I'm, I'm I would chime in there again. Um, basically, I think the advisors, um, uh, probably there will be jobs lost, full stop. Yeah? But the, um, the, the point uh, that we need to look at is there are, there's a huge population currently who is underbanked and underserved and under-advised. Thanks to the regulations in some countries in Europe, in the Netherlands, in the UK, for instance, there's a huge chunk of the population that cannot get financial advice currently because it, in the past it, it has been all financed with commissions and kickbacks from the, <laughs> uh, from the, from the uh, asset managers and from the funds and from the manufacturers of the products and that has been all stopped. So now today when you go and want to get financial advice in those countries you need to fork out uh, $1,500 to $2,000 uh, for that advice and that really just puts out a, a whole big part of the market uh, off-site. Um, and and um, the intelligent assistance we're talking about here actually can, can bring, uh, if not salvation, uh, help uh, to, these, uh, to these segments in the market. Um, and it can, they can help then in the, not in the AI, but in the IA form, in the intelligence amplified form, mm. help the financial advisors serve their customers, uh, uh, the private banking or the wealthier, more affluent customers even better. Yeah. It's the democratization of these uh, 
well, it, it allows them to scale and move up the value chain. That's, right. that's really what it does. Excellent. So, I think, oh, Derek, another oh, question? Yeah, play, move to the what? break, so. Oh, <laughs> I was gonna say, so now we're gonna enter our last break uh, to discuss um, what we've just heard. I wanna thank this panel, because it is, the, the vertical challenge is are gonna be where a lot of interesting, uh, tackling them is where a lot of interesting mm -hmm. developments happening. So thank our panel. Thank you.